Copenhagen, cycling is not a new thing. Quite a lot of cycle tracks were done in Denmark in the, in the 20s and 30s. But then what we saw in the 50s, 60s, 70s was that the car was a new thing. Uh, everybody was getting more wealthy, the planners liked the cars, everything was kind of now being planned around the car. But then what happened in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s in Copenhagen was a combination of things. There were the, the oil crisis, so there was a general maybe rethinking of, okay, how do, how do our transport system work? And there was also resistance within the city of Copenhagen from the citizens saying, hey, don't let the cars squeeze out all the bikes. Uh, don't let the cars take over all the streets. You should rethink the, the, the way the city works. I think almost everybody in Copenhagen today would say, luckily, uh, the politicians listened back then. And since the early 80s have started then again building on this uh, culture of cycling and going back to improving the cycling network instead of squeezing the bikes out. What happened first in the early 80s was that they took these uh, major uh, streets going to the city center, uh, where you have all the shops, where you have most of the people, and took away car lanes or car parking and put in cycle tracks on those uh, key streets. And then working from there, more and more missing links have been eliminated, they've been put in bridges across the harbor to make the travel time competitive for walking and cycling compared with the cars. Uh, intersections has been improved. And today you have a good quality for cycling. It feels safe, it is safe. These years, the focus is very much on, on keep improving the quality and maybe also, especially actually on parts of the system that are very busy, may, many, many people cycling, to think about how can we make alternative routes, uh, make wider cycle tracks. So it's also a, it's a little bit uh, less um, busy or intimidating if you're not used to going on a bike or if you're a kid and so on. But the, the network is more or less in place. Now it's more about whether we need to, to improve the quality. The general design principles behind the cycling network is, is really the backbone of the system is what we call a, a cycle track. So that means it's a, a, a space for cycling that is separated towards the cars, towards the car lanes and towards the sidewalk by a, by a small curb. So you have that uh, feeling of a physical separation towards the motor vehicles that all research show is, is, is key if you want to make cycling mainstream, if you want normal people to feel safe when they cycle. So that is the, the backbone of the system. Uh, in the old days, the standard width was uh, 2 meters 25, so you can always cycle two next to each other. Now we've had a huge increase in cargo bikes in Copenhagen, so therefore the standard width has been expanded to 250, because now then also you can overtake a cargo bike, and even on a good day, two cargo bikes can overtake each other. Uh, so that's now the, the standard. In the city, there's a um, prioritized net for cycling, we call it the, the, the plus net, which is the key streets. And there we, we aim to where possible to have uh, three meter or 280 on each side, because that gives you three lanes next to each other for cycling each direction. So if you're a dad cycling with your kid, you can cycle next to each other and there's still room for somebody to overtake. Then as a supplement to the cycle tracks, then we of course have traffic calm streets. A lot of streets you don't need to build infrastructure, you just need to get the speed of the car down, you just need to get the amount of cars down, then everybody can cycle there or walk. Then we also have a network of what we call uh, green cycle routes, which is mostly paths that are separated from road traffic and, you know, running along lakes like where I'm here now or through parks and whatever. So it's an alternative to the cycle track uh, along the, the, the streets with cars. And then on top of this, we also have this concept of super cycle highways that within the city, you don't see the difference, but the, the key about those is that, you know, if you are on a super cycle highway, it continues for a long way out to the suburbs, maybe for, I don't know, 10 miles, 15 miles, and you know this is coherent, I will not suddenly be in a no man's land where there's no cycle tracks. But within the city, you don't see the, the, the difference necessarily. So it's this mix of different kinds of facilities that make up the whole, whole system for cycling. We, we have a lot of development going on in, in the greater Copenhagen region. But the most part, if we look 10, 15 years back, has happened in the old harbor areas, uh, quite close to the center of, of Copenhagen. We, we now stand at, um, at Sluseholmen, which is a new area in, in the southern harbor in, in Copenhagen. 
It's probably 15,000 people uh, living here. It has been developed since 2006. It's an area that, that, that formerly was the harbor, but has now been converted to a uh, residential area that is um, considered, I think, quite attractive. The location is good. You can get to the city center by bike in uh, 15 minutes. You can take the bus, it's maybe 20 minutes. You can also take your car if you want. There's even a harbor bus, so also it's very nice with the access to the water, you can swim and so on, but you're also very close to the, the city center and the, the dense part of, of Copenhagen. Regarding cycling, you could say Suseholm is a standard new development in Copenhagen, which means you put in uh, cycle tracks, these separated space for cycling from the very beginning. That's the standard solution in Copenhagen. So you know when you move in such a place, there will be, yeah, there will be cycle tracks. You'll be able to cycle on the cycle tracks to wherever you go in the city from here. Uh, there's bike parking in most yards. Uh, here you have both bike parking on the surface, and then you also have bike parking in, in, the, in the basement kind of thing. If you have more expensive bikes or during the winter, so you have these options for parking your bike. Those people selling the apartment put up big posters, whatever they often write, you know, 15 minutes by bike to the city center. So it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's very, very normal. It's, everybody can take the bike, takes the bike sometimes. So it's just an integrated part of the development, but in a way also a so normal part. So you don't think so much about it. It's, everybody would expect to have good cycling facilities when, you, when they move into such an area. This area also have, of course, cars. And uh, it actually is an area that's quite well connected to the highway. If you go this way, you get quite easily to the highway. Uh, there's also obviously uh, car parking here. But what is key in these new uh, areas is that you actually, you kind of, you unbundle the car parking from the rent. And now the trend in Copenhagen is you don't do underground car parking uh, below apartments uh, anymore. You do car parking in centralized structures where you pool car parking together because then you force people to do that little walk if they want to use their car. Plus, it's very hard just now to imagine what about the, the automated vehicles, uh, the car sharing, the, the, the Uber, whatever, how much car parking will we need in the future? And if you do these um, centralized but, but separate structures for car parking, it's also much more flexible. You can reconvert and you haven't put all this money into very, very expensive uh, garages below the development. Here we are standing in front of what is called Dronning Louise's Bridge, uh, the Queen Louise Bridge, and that leads into Nørrebrogade, which is that direction. And Nørrebrogade is the busiest street for cycling in, in Copenhagen, but it's one of four main corridors leading into the city center, uh, going through dense residential areas with a lot of shops, a lot of things happening. And this Nørrebrogade is, is actually now uh, a street where more than 40,000 people uh, cycle each day. This street was uh, redesigned 10 years ago to make the design reflect how many people were actually cycling and walking on this street. So now you cannot, on this street, now Broca, you cannot go through in a car. You can still drive in a car, but you cannot use it to go through to the suburbs. It's, it's kind of blocked for through going car traffic. And that made it possible to reduce the car traffic with around 50% made it possible to expand the width of the cycle tracks, it made it possible to improve conditions for the buses and make wider sidewalks as well. And the interesting thing from a mobility perspective is that that redesign has made this street more efficient when it comes to move people. It's moving less in cars, but in total the street is moving more people now due to this, uh, this redesign. And on top of that, the, 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 the public space, the public life quality in the street has been improved due to yeah, less noise for cars, uh, a bit better air and so on, due to less emissions and so on. In Denmark, um, the main part of cycling infrastructure is financed by the municipalities. So it's different from municipality to municipality, how much do we invest in cycling? Uh, in Copenhagen, it goes a little bit up and down, but since the, the mid zeros, where there's been an increased focus on cycling, also on funding, I think the average funding per year has been somewhere around, what would that be, like 20 pounds per citizen per year uh, in funding for cycling infrastructure. 
But you can always discuss if a new bridge is done, both for cycling and walking, if a whole street is redesigned, how much is, is, is for cycling specifically. But it's in that range when we try to make up the numbers, how much do we actually invest in cycling. And Copenhagen is probably the city that invests the most in cycling per citizen, also because so many citizens here cycle. It's a key part of the overall mobility system. Then the municipalities the last 10, 15 years have received some support from the national level. There's been a pool of money municipalities could apply for, so they could go get co-financing of projects with maybe 30%, 50%. Um, and that has also helped the city of Copenhagen a little bit, but especially maybe some of the smaller municipalities that don't have the same economy as the city of Copenhagen have.